So what I want to talk about today is my Beacon project, but um, I kind of lied. I'm actually going to talk about a lock-in amplifier. And uh, uh, it's a lock-in, it's a, a, a beacon uh, that's doing a mode that I made up called QRRS. And I'll explain that in a, in a second. But I want to talk about uh, uh, the beacon I'm using and this thing called a lock-in amplifier. So I just, background, what I'm going to do is just going to talk about why am I doing this, some fundamentals about a lock-in amplifier, a little bit of design, and then I'm going to show you the results that, that I'm getting, which I want to get to the results because that's more interesting. So just my usual caveat, I have no idea what I'm talk, talking about. Don't listen to, to me. This is just the rantings of what I kind of figured out. Could be right, could be wrong. Take what I say with a grain of salt. So as usual, here's some references if you want to uh, dig into a locking amplifier. There's a couple of really good videos that I use to uh, learn about this mode. And as well, I ran across this guy, Mark uh, Schittnicker. I, I, sorry, Mark, if I butchered your, your, your name. Um, but uh, he's got a really good video about how to measure signals with noise. If you've got a really noisy signal, there he's showing an example of a really noisy signal, and he's able to pull out the signal from the noise with just a simple scope. Very interesting video. So the reason I'm doing this is that uh, the 2024 eclipse is coming up, and uh, Hamsai has uh, put out a uh, request for people to get on to Whisper and RBN and use their grape. A module so that they could uh, uh, glean some physics about uh, uh, the ionosphere. And I see this as an excellent opportunity to do some experimentation uh, of myself. So, you know, the 2024 eclipse is coming up. It's in like, what, two weeks? What do we do? So, you know, the eclipse lasts for maybe two or three minutes at most. The entire duration is maybe two, two and a half hours, uh, two hours, just over two, two hours. And uh, so where I am, it's probably going to be seconds, probably going to be 10, 20 seconds, because I'm not at the point of uh, to totality. So nighttime is going to be less than a minute. And sunrise, sunset is going to be, you know, of the order of two and a half hours if you're in the maximum air, in the best air area. But it'll be much shorter for I am, maybe, you know, less than an hour. So we talked before, and you know, some of us said, you know, we'd run Whisper. That'd be great because uh, Hamsai could take that data, and if you've got an aggregate of hundreds of people running Whisper, you know, it averages out that you can get some pretty good measurements. But for one person using Whisper, it's not a very good platform because number one, it transmits in even minutes and it takes two minutes to complete. So if I've got like 10 or 20 seconds of night, uh, Whisper is not a, it's a non-start for me. It's great for Hampsi, but for my ex purposes of my experimentation, not gonna work. There's, there's R RBN. And uh, this is typically a spotting network. It's not usually not meant for prop propagation, but it can be used. Uh, it's used for making contacts. And uh, the problem is it does not identify every transmission. So if you transmit a CW signal now, 10 seconds later, you transmit the same CW signal. It's only going to show one spot, that first signal. So you don't get a grand granularity over, you know, tens of seconds. It's probably over minutes. It's only going to spot you over uh, several minutes. So again, not a good uh, uh, non-start for me. So I, I decided to build my own uh, beacon and uh, develop my own propagation mode. So I looked, first of all, I looked at uh, something called QRSS, which is like the QRS, which is the slow code, everyone's familiar with QRS, and the extra S means slow. So it's really slow, but it's meant more for visual decoding, and it's slow. I guess you could automate it, but it's going to take a, quite a bit of processing 
to go and do that. So I needed to develop a, a mechanism to detect a transmission. So I decided to send a short CW identifier saying, you know, V3OI, and then transmit a constant carrier for about 15 seconds or so. And a carrier is much easier to detect. Um, and I, I need to also make the carrier short, short enough so I'm not going to piss anyone off. Because if you got a very long uh, carrier, you know, that's, uh, what's it, that's noise. You, you could be uh, uh, generating um, harmful interference, I think it's called. So you want it short of, of the order of an antenna tuner, you know, going off. So and this is just an explanation of what QRSS is. And it's just you got, uh, if no one doesn't familiar with this, it's where you've got your dots and dashes or several seconds. And I've seen some people where they take, uh, you know, 30 seconds to transmit a dot or a dash. And what happens when you do that, you could go on a visual visualizer and you could actually see the dits and dots. Now, QRSS, QRRS does not exist. It's something I fab fabricated. So the architecture I'm using for my beacon is I've got my beacon. It's going to transmit this QR, QRRS signal. I'm going to use a web SDR to listen for it. Then I wrote a little program in Python that's using this thing called a lock-in amplifier, which I'll talk about in a second. And I'm using that to detect the signal. And right here, you can see it's detected three signals here. And uh, also, what I'm also doing is I've, I've built this uh, um, completely different um, uh, project. Is I built a solar tracker, and during the eclipse, it's going to be following the sun. And it's got some sensor arrays. I've only got three sensors here, a solar cell, UV, and an IR camera mounted. And it's got also got IR sensors inside this uh, little crosshair thing here. It's going to have cameras and uh, temperature sensors and other sensors uh, mounted. And it's going to track the sun and make measurements during the eclipse. So uh, this is my plea, my request for help. This is one of the reasons I'm doing this this talk is I'm putting out a plea. I need help. And uh, if, you know, uh, you could use a web SDR um, and tune it in and run my Python program to listen for my signal, or you can use your own radio, provided your radio is connected to a sound card on your PC, then you could use my little Python program to detect my QRS uh, signal. You could save it. And then I could use that data to see uh, what happened during the eclipse. So if any of you would like, like to help, let me know. Um, I'd certainly uh, uh, looking for help. So how do you detect that, that carrier now? So I talked about my QRRS is going to send out a short identifier and a carrier. So how do I detect that carrier? Well, there's lots of ways of doing it. I just listed a couple ways here. One is using a fast Fourier transform. Not going to go into that uh, detail there, but there's different there are forms of a Fourier transform. There's a fast Fourier transform, decrete, a discrete Gertzel algorithm. If you go back to uh, my talk on um, um, fast Fourier transform, I talk about that. There's a link there. You could go back and listen to that. You could also use uh, a correlation. And a fast Fourier transform is another form of a correlation. You are, you are doing a correlation. Um, but uh, when I talk about this, I'm talking about doing a convolution. In my video here, I talk about how I use a signal correlation, something called an autocorrelation, to detect RIDI and PSK. And uh, that's one way of doing it. And the reason I did that was because I used a, a 16, uh, uh, no, um, 16 megahertz Arduino the, um, uh, what's it, the mega, uh, mega board. I use that to detect RIDI and PSK. And as I was going through trying to find al alternate ways of doing this, because ideally I want to do it, uh, I'd like to do it in a microcontroller. I ended up not doing it in a microcontroller, but that's not uh, because it cannot be done. Um, I stumbled across this thing called a lock-in amplifier. And this, uh, 
this is showing a typical lock-in amp amplifier. It's a lot of money. It's used to detect no, um, sig um, pull signals from noise. If you've got a very noisy signal and you want to get that signal, uh, this thing can uh, pull that signal out of out of the noise. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about uh, the lock-in amplifier. Now there's a really good video here. I cited this on uh, my reference, and uh, it talks about how a lock-in amplifier works. And it also gives an example of how a garage door sensor, you know the sensor at the bottom of your garage door uh, opener, when you break it, the garage door stops. Well, if that sensor is in light, it's still able to detect when you break that beam. So, and uh, once it's in direct sunlight, it's noise. So he talks about how the lock-in amplifiers used to do that. And again, you know, most of lock-in amplifiers I saw were hardware-based. Very little I saw about software until I ran across this um, presentation here. It's not about software, but it's just how it works. But he breaks it down so sim simply that you're able to go and uh, develop some software to do this. So basically, how does it work? Very simple. You've got your signal. This is your signal you want to detect. By the way, am I still on the air here? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Okay, so the red signal is a signal you want to detect. In this case, I'm keeping it simple. It's a pure sine wave, okay? So you've got this pure sine, sine wave. Say it's 1300 Hertz, okay? then you've got a reference signal. Your reference signal must be the exact frequency of your input signal. It's just a reference signal. So what you do, you multiply the two signals together. You take each point and you multiply it together. Well, when you multiply two signals together in the time domain, you're doing mixing. That's basically you're mixing the two signals. So if you have a 1300 hertz signal here, reference signal, uh, 1300 hertz reference signal, and a 1300 hertz actual signal, you mix them together, what do you get? You get two, uh, the sum and differences. You get 1300 plus 1300, you get 2600, you get two times the frequency, but you get the difference, which is zero, which is a DC, zero. So you get zero hertz. So, and that's where, that's where the trick here is. So, this is showing the multiplication. This is the red is my uh, signal trace, and the green is the resulting multiplication. Now, I shrunk it. It's not drawn to scale. It should be two times the frequency of the red signal, but I just drew it this way for dr dramatic effect. Okay. So, here you can see the red signal. If you take the average of the red signal, it's got a negative, goes from negative one to plus one. And if you average this red signal over time, you'll get zero because it's a bipolar signal. It's going, it's, it's uh, going, it's crossing equally across the zero axis here. However, if you look at the resulting multiplication signal, it's going from zero to one. It's, it's, it's going um, up, it doesn't cross zero. It's a unipolar signal. Now, if you average this out, because it's going from zero to one, you average it out, it's gonna come out to 0.5. So it's got a DC offset. So now it just so happens when you do this magically, the DC offset is always half the signal amplitude. That's a really cool feature because all of a sudden you could use a lock-in amplifier to measure the amplitude of uh, the original signal, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I have to give a little bit of background now about how my software works. It's all visual, but uh, hopefully um, I don't confuse anyone here. So just I'm going to be using this frequency spectrum here along the x-axis here. This is, uh, this is showing frequency. This is a fast Fourier transform, so it's kind of like an SA, spectrum analyzer output. You're seeing frequency along the bottom. And uh, along the y-axis, it's just telling you the magnitude, how strong the signal is. So in this case, we've got a 1300 hertz sig signal. 
uh, it should say AC. And then down here at zero hertz, that'll be DC. Okay, so it's showing that you've got uh, no DC associated with the signal. So this is a, just another way of showing that same diagram I did, but now you can see here, it's centered around zero. So if you average this, it's zero. There's no DC offset here. So if you take the fast Fourier transform of that, you'll get the 13, this is 1300 Hertz. You'll get the 1300 Hertz peak in the FFT and you'll get zero at, at zero Hertz because there's no DC, right? So now let's add some DC, DC to that signal. So in this diagram, zero axis is down here. We've lifted this signal up, we've added some DC. So if you look at the average, you take the average of this signal, it's right here. So you can see it's a unipolar signal with a DC offset here. So if you were to take the fast Fourier transform, you'll still get the 1300, this is not drawn to scale by the way. So you'll still get the 1300 Hertz signal here, and but you now get a spike here at zero, which is the DC, that represents the DC signal here. So now what happens when we say we have a signal outside, we've got this spectrum here, we've got an unwanted signal, but we just want this 1300 hertz signal. Well, we could do a low pass filter. And when you do a low pass filter, you just get rid of this signals beyond this point here. They get attenuated based on this roll off here and you'll get your uh, signal, but you also get the DC signal if it's present. I think you, some of you are seeing where I'm going. Uh, with, with this. So now let's just say you've got a DC signal and you've got an unwanted signal out, out here. You've got some kind of DC offset, but you just want to get your signal alone without the DC offset. Well, you use the bandpass filter and that band, bandpass filter will only pass the frequencies within the pass band here. Everything beyond the, whatever the three dB points here are, it's going to get uh, knocked down. So now what happens if we want to detect the DC offset? We've got a DC offset here, and you could, I, some of you should be able to see where I'm going now with this. So now if I've got my 1300 Hertz signal and a DC offset, but I only want to get the DC offset, what I could do is low pass filter it, but my cutoff now is going to be maybe 100 Hertz or 200 Hertz, where I'm just going to knock out this main uh, frequency here, and I only get the DC signal passing through. So let me tie all this together now. So a lock-in amp amplifier and DC, I've been talking about DC a lot. Let me tie everything together now. So noise is typically bi bipolar and typically has a DC average of zero. Noise typically has no DC offset. This is key to a lock-in amplifier. So if you've got a signal with noise and you've got your reference signal with noise, so, so, so your signal has noise, your reference signal has no noise, and you multiply them together. Remember I showed you, you get the signal at twice the frequency plus the DC off, offset, provided the reference signal is the same frequency as the signal. Now, noise will not contribute to the DC offset because it averages out to zero. So that's the trick of a lock-in amplifier right there, is it removes the noise because it assumes the noise is going to average out to zero. If your noise doesn't average out to zero, then this is not going to work. So the trick to make this work, this only works for repetitive, unmodulated signals, so a carrier. That's why I said, okay, I'm going to send a carrier. So the reference signal must be the same fre frequency. And after multiplying the signal and reference, if there's any DC present, the signal's there. The reference signal is in that um, signal you're uh, trying to de de detect. Now, something else happens um, if your reference and your actual signal are out of phase, let's just say they're 180 degrees out of phase, you multiply them, you get zero. So which means that your this 
this algorithm doesn't work. It'll come out of zero. There's no DC, so it isn't there. So what you have to do in that case, you have to use quadrature signals. You have to, your reference signal, you have to take the cosine and the sine. Now, the thing about these um, quadrature signals, they're, they're orthogonal to one another. They're at 90 degrees. So if you take the result you get by multiplying sine of your signal, of, of, of your reference, and cosine of your reference, you take both of those, they're at right angles to one another. And if you want the magnitude, you're basically, it's a right angle triangle, and it's just the sum of squares. It, uh, high school math or high school um, vectors or algebra or whatever. So how does this work? So let me tie it all together now in a nice pretty bowl. So you've got your signal here with noise. Okay, so the first thing you do, you pass it through a band, band pass filter. And what that's gonna do, that's gonna remove any higher frequency components and it's gonna remove any DC uh, components. Now, one of the things I didn't mention is that, let me go back to this signal here. One of the things I didn't mention here is that if this reference signal is a harmonic of your main frequency, it'll show up as a DC off, offset. Um, so you want to filter this to remove any harmonics of your main signal. So you're getting the signal alone. Because if you run this with any harmonics of the signal, it's... Um, it's not, it's not going to work. So where was I? I was here. So you do your bandpass filter to only get your signal um, that you want to see if it's there. You're getting rid of anything uh, below it or, or above it. Then you're going to multiply that by your reference signal. Now, in actual fact, you have to multiply it by sine and cosine. you you got to use the quad quadrature, but let's ignore that for the time being. So you're just going to multiply it by your reference. Then the output, you're going to low pass filter because we want to get the DC. We want to see if the DC is there. And once you low pass filter it, you'll get a diagram like this. You'll get a, a graph like, like, like this. Now you do get some oscillation here because that low pass filter is not ideal. It's not saying zero hertz or nothing. It's actually got some bandwidth to it. So it may have a cutoff frequency of say 100 hertz or 200 hertz. So what you're seeing here is what's fall, uh, falling into that pass band. You're seeing 100 or 200 hertz signals coming across there. But if you look at the average, definitely you're getting a DC offset here. So this signal is present in, that, um, in this sig sig signal here. So what I do is I also take an FFT. And um, uh, after the band, band pass filter, I also take an FFT. And uh, let me, I think, uh, hopefully you could see that. So if you take an FFT of your band pass uh, filtered uh, data, you get this. Now it kind of looks strange. You get a whole bunch of points here, but you get nothing out here. And that's because the band pass filter has knocked everything down here. This is your pass band here. And you can see the 1300 hertz signal is actually present. So the FFT is actually doing a great job. It actually detected that signal in the noise. And all this junk here is just noise at that frequency. Any um, noise that's around that frequency, around the, the 1300 hertz, it's showing up because you can't filter that out. So what I did for testing is I wrote a little Python program and my Python program, uh, you know, I defined the sample frequency, the maximum sing, uh, signal amplitude, the maximum noise amp amplitude. And I also played around with adding a DC offset just to make sure that the bandpass filter was, was working. So I generated uh, a data, some data, and I generated uh, 1300 Hertz, which which is what I want to detect, 2300 hertz, and then 1000 hertz, something close to 1300 hertz, and then I put in a whole bunch of noise. 
And in this sample I did here, I did all kinds of different samples, but in this one I'm showing, uh, my noise is twice the amplitude, twice my signal amplitude. And so the red is my signal and the blue is my reference signal. So you could almost say that that signal, the blue signal is there and the red signal, it kind of looks like it. But if you go through, um, you do the band, bandpass filter, you do the FFT, then you do the lock-in, definitely you see the signals present. The FFT shows the signals present. That's 1300 Hertz right there. And this is showing the, uh, the DC uh, here offset. Now, again, the interesting thing is, remember I said it's supposed to show half the amplitude. So if the amplitude's 16, this is showing just a smidgen above eight. So it's showing roughly about half of the amp amplitude here, right? And it's kind of it interesting. The FFT is also doing the same thing. It's showing about uh, it's showing uh, the amplitude half the amplitude of that signal. And I think it's because the way an FFT works, it's your uh, you're getting a mirror image. It's uh, I don't want to get into it, but if you do uh, an FFT, you have to take half of the spectrum, so you get half of the power. Something like like that. So uh, in my last uh, uh, presentation, I talked about how I used um, a buffer driver here to increase the output of a BS170. You could go back if you missed that and you want to see how that works. You could go and look look at that video. But basically, I prototyped my uh, beacon and uh, I'm driving it with this uh, uh, buffer driver chip here. And my last presentation, I showed that I was able to get almost twice the power output from without the uh, um, buffer chip. And I was able to get at least one watt right across uh, the HF uh, spectrum. So from that, I went and I created my beacon. And you could see uh, Arduino Nano there. There's the SI5351. And I decided to use a real-time clock instead of using a GPS, and it works out just fine. Um, I was able to uh, do Whisper with this real-time clock, it works. I'm able to do Whisper. So with this, uh, I wrote a Python program to configure it as opposed to going in and configuring it via your program or using a CLI, because uh, anyone who knows the way I work, I just love a CLI, a command line interface. So I configure everything using a CLI. So in this case, I, I, I decided to write a GUI and you check what, what, what you want and it configures the board for you. And so this is written in uh, uh, Python. So it um, you could define what modes, you've got three modes. You could uh, use C, C, CW for RBN, you could use Whisper, or you could use my mode QRRS. And you could define when it's going to start, how long it's going to last, how long it's going to repeat, and uh, and uh, so forth. And you could also calibrate the clock. You could tell it to write what your actual PC clock, so you could calibrate the clock for your uh, your real real time clock. And so for the data capture, I again I used the Python, and so you need a sound card. You, you got to have a sound card connected to your, to your radio. It needs audio coming from the uh, radio. And the radio is tuned to the QRRS frequency. And it's it listens to a sound card device. And it uh, uh, gets the data from the sound sound card. And then it performs you know, the, the steps I just said. It does a bandpass filter. It, uh, it uh, does an FFT. It uh, generates the uh, signal, and you de define the signal you want to define here. So if, if it's 1300 hertz, you say 1300 hertz. It generates the reference signal, multiplies them, does the lock-in, does all that, and it can also save it to a file. So now I want let's talk about the date, data. That's it. I'm done. I just want, want to show you some of the data I captured. So this is one output I got. Clearly, you could see there's three peaks here. So now the um, QRRS wakes up. I think it was every 15 for this test was every 15 or 20 seconds. 
So you can see it's very repetition, uh, repetitious in nature. You can see peaks here. The green, the, the bluish green, uh, I'm colorblind, <laughs> uh, peak here, that's what the lock-in is predict predicting, it's seeing, and the green is showing what the FFT. And then this is telling me what the lock-in frequency thinks it is, and this is telling me what the FFT frequency it is. And then I got a little flashing icon here that says, loop, 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 I found 1324, uh, frequency of 1324 hertz. So here's another look at the same thing again. Now, it just, I'm using Python, I'm using the uh, uh, Python lib, I can't remember what it's called, library. And uh, when you plot in real time, it kind of compresses the, the data. So you get all the peaks kind of squished together. So this was over some time. You could definitely see some weak signals here. Then you see some stronger signals here. And you're seeing, again, FFT and the lock-in uh, calculations there. And this is just showing my uh, Digital Master 780. It's showing my QRSS. You could see the um, C CW here. And then you could see the carrier being broadcast here. And here's I just I, the next set of slides is, is just some different views. So here you could see some here. You can see that there's a peak here, but the uh, the lock-in predicts a peak, but the FFT doesn't. Here both FFT and lock-in predicts a peak. Same thing here. So and the key thing is if you look, they're evenly spaced. So it's definitely detecting a signal there. Here you could see the same thing here. You could definitely see the signal present. This is just another view here, the lock-in popping up saying, hey, found a frequency. I'm seeing it at 1290. The FFT is saying it's saying it at 13, 13 hertz. And uh, this next test I'm going to show, it turns out as I was doing this on the radio, there was something right adjacent, like 100 hertz away and uh, it's Olivia or something and it was, it was quite it was quite significant it was uh, quite loud so and I was still able to detect my signal even with that signal present it still worked and here now if you listen very carefully you can hear the signal this the first at first you're going to hear it where it's really 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 weak you could barely hear it in in the noise I don't know if you just heard, heard the carrier there. And here it is with very loud. So and then this is just an export uh, coming out into Excel. Uh, you can uh, ex it uh, exports the data into Excel, and this way you can um, expand it, and you could look better look for peaks. And this is just showing two different views. One is showing the uh, FFT grayed out, and you're seeing the lock-in, and this other one is showing the lock-in grayed out and the FFT, and you could kind of see the peaks be be between them. And here you could definitely see something way down here in the noise. I've expanded it, so you're seeing a signal there, and that's it. Now, just in final, one of the things, the reason why I chose 14.100 is because 14.100 is for unattended beacons. That's where you would put a, a uh, unattended beacon. So it's um, perfectly okay putting this on uh, 14.100. So, that's it, and uh, I'll take questions now.